Right, so today we'll be reading from uh, 2 John, uh, which can be found on page 125 um, of the Church Bibles, or Large Print Bibles, uh, 1214. Right, starting at first one. To the elder of the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have from the beginning, that we love one another. And this love that we walk that we walk to according to his commandments, this is the commandment, just as you have heard it from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves, so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face, so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. Well, thank you, Anna, for reading that. It's good to see some of our uni students back with us this morning. Let's talk to God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for your word. We pray now as we look at it, we pray that you'd stir up our hearts, stir up our affections towards you, that we can walk in truth and love as we seek to live wholeheartedly for you. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'll ask you a question this morning as we start out. Have you ever been deceived? Maybe from purchasing that product that ended up promising something better, but it turned out to be a dud. Maybe you've been dece deceived by some statistics and someone makes a prediction based on those statistics and it turns out to be untrue. Do we need to remind ourselves of the news poll statistics before the last election? Those statistics were deceptive because obviously it wasn't a true sample of the Australian population. But perhaps the greatest of all deceptions of humankind has pulled off was the Trojan horse. When the Trojan Paris took off with Helen, the wife of the Spartan king, war erupted. It went for about 10 years and the Trojans then almost finally believed they've overcome the Greeks. But in a stroke of genius, the Greeks built this enormous wooden horse and hollowed out the belly in which men could hide in. And the Greeks convinced the Trojans that this was a peace offering. And the Trojans happily accepted it and brought the horse within the walls of their fortified city. So that night, the Trojans slept and the Greeks hidden inside snuck out the trapdoor. Then they proceeded to slaughter and decisively defeat the Trojans. Maybe you are slightly sceptical about everything because you've been deceived before. I think probably everyone in this room has been deceived before in one way, shape or form. And let's be honest, we've probably all deceived people before in our, in our own uh, works. And fathers are especially good at this. Uh, just for example, asking your child for a high five and then pulling away, saying too slow. And well, mothers, you don't get off as easily either. Um, have you ever decided to deceive your child into eating healthy food? Now, I know there's good motivations behind that, but how many times have you made that meal that you can trick them into eating their vegetables? Now, all of these little deceptions in our lives make us skeptical, but yet 
people still get taken for a ride. People get scammed by phone calls and emails that there was always people out there looking to take advantage of you. But the antidote to being scammed or deceived is knowing the truth so that you're not easily taken for a ride, so you're not easily led astray. And as we see, the author of 2 John the Elder reminds his readers of the truth. Now, he doesn't explicitly say what the truth is because they already know the truth about Jesus, that he is writing to a people who know the truth. There is assumed knowledge in this little letter. Have a look at verse 1 with me. It says this, The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Now, before we even dive into this morning's passage, I want to ask you, what is truth? Now, the reason I want you to think about it is, do you define truth in the same way that your friends, your family or your work colleagues define truth? See, today we live in a world that says, speak your truth. I'll say it again, speak your truth. And hopefully at this moment you're thinking, Mark, well, it's either true or it isn't, right? It's not just your truth, it's the truth. And well, yes, but we live in a world where feelings quite often trump truth. And if we feel so strongly about something, well, it's got to be true, right? And well, if you think I'm crazy at this point, a lot of people do perceive truth in that way. It's like there's a massive portion of our population that reflect that famous line from that movie, A Few Good Men, where Tom Cruise yells at Jack Nicholson, get that right, I want the truth. And then he replied, you can't handle the truth. And yet, so maybe even some of you here today think of truth in that way, that you measure its truthfulness on how much you feel, how much you want it to be true, regardless of the facts. But when it comes to the truth, the reality is that facts don't care about your feelings. Just because we feel something to be true doesn't necessarily mean it is true. That truth is not easily defined as it once was in our society. That we only have to look at our politicians to see how much you can stretch the truth in any such matter. But I think there's also even a larger group in our society in Australia that desire the truth. And quite often they don't even know what that truth is that they're seeking out, but that they desire truth. That there is this group of people who are sick of all the spin that they hear on TV and the internet and just want to cut straight to the truth. Now, I'm sure you've watched in interviews by politicians on both sides of the fence and just felt like screaming at them, cut to the truth. And that today in this little letter of 2 John, we see that the truth is really important. The truth about Jesus. And as the elder writes this letter to remind them to stick to the truth. That like a coach reminds his players to stick to the game plan, he doesn't necessarily replay all the game plan because he knows they heard the game plan at the start of the match. That there's this assumed knowledge. And just like that halftime speech, the elder, as he writes this letter, is telling this group of Christians to focus on the truth. Now, he doesn't specifically go into all of what Jesus has done because he knows that they know that already. That this truth he writes about is the truth about Jesus Christ. And in John's gospel, we're reminded about this truth in many, many passages. But in particular, in John chapter 14, verse 6, where it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That the truth about Jesus is that he is the only way to God the Father. That all of what Jesus has done, they have most likely read about it in at least John's gospel, if not the other gospels 
at this point when they received this letter. That this group of Christians know that Jesus was truly perfect, that he truly came and died on the cross for sin. But because he was perfect, he wasn't dying for his sin, but he was dying for their sin, for our sin. That he truly took the punishment due to them, due to us, so that these believers, that us as believers, don't have to face the judgment we deserve for our sin. That Jesus took the judgment upon himself so that we as believers, so that the believers who originally read this letter may know the truth about Jesus Christ. That he came to save sinners like them, to save sinners like you, to save sinners like me. That Jesus' death on the cross was the greatest act of love the world has witnessed. That the good news is Jesus didn't stay dead, but he rose again three days later, conquering death. That death has died and love has won. That we see this in verse 4 of this morning's passage. It says, I rejoice greatly to find some, some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. That if we remember Jesus' words to his disciples before he ascended to the right hand of God the Father, he said this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That for followers of Jesus, we're to obey the commands of God. Now, we aren't perfect at it, and that's why we needed Jesus to die on the cross for us. But nonetheless, we are still to follow his commands. And as we saw a few weeks ago in the series in the Gospel of Mark, and if you haven't seen them, you can check them out on the church website. But through that series, we saw that the commandments can be summed up like this from chapter 12 in the Gospel of Mark. It says, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. That's simply put, to love God and to love others. We see as the writer writes in verse 5, it says, And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. That they have known this ever since they started following Jesus. That the love is at the center of the gospel message. That the love is at the center of the good news about Jesus. Now, in the previous letter in 1 John, you can watch that Bible project video a little later to watch the whole one. But in the book of 1 John, prior to this letter, it says this in chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another, for, the love, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. And anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. That the greatest display of love that the world has ever seen was Jesus when he died on the cross. And the only reason that we can love is because he first loved us. But as we think about love, we need to understand how the Bible talks about love. Have a look at verse 6. It says this, And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. See, the Bible doesn't talk about love in the way that Hollywood talks about love. See, the Bible doesn't talk about love based on some sort of initial feelings, but rather it talks about love in a different way. Have a look at these words from John chapter 15. It says, 
This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. See, this picture of love that we get from the Bible isn't this picture of Hollywood love, but rather a picture of self-sacrificing, commandment, obeying kind of love. It sounds very countercultural, doesn't it? To our world's view, to what we see on TV as they portray what love is. That the Bible doesn't command you to love yourself because God knows that, well, we do that by nature. But he does command us to love him and to love others because, well, we're not very good at it. It doesn't come naturally to us, does it? That when we think of loving God, in what ways are we loving God? Are we praying to him? Are we hearing from him as we read his word in the Bible? Are we singing him songs of praise? Do we obey all that he has commanded, just as we read about before in the Great Commission? So no wonder God commanded us to do this because it doesn't come naturally to us, does it? How often do you sit and reflect yourself, right now I really can't think of how I could be loving God more. It never really happens, does it? Because more often than not, we're focused on loving ourselves and we're all guilty of it, aren't we? That how are we going with loving others? It's hard, isn't it? I'm sure you can think of someone that perhaps you're struggling to love at the moment with God-centered love, even though we know that we've been called to love others. This is why God commanded it, because it doesn't come naturally to us. That when we're walking in truth and love, we're walking a walk that is obedient to God, and as his children, quite often, we have the tendency to be disobedient children, don't we? That, you know, from dinner time with children, they don't always obey the command, even though if your message is simple as just eat. Yet, simply put, we sometimes do this to God, don't we? That we quite often disobey God in the same way that something being quite as simple as a command like that that we often live in disobedience to god and that is why walking in love is hard and why we need to be reminded of it that though it is hard it doesn't mean that we just give up on living out the good news of jesus see true christian love can't be separated from living according to all that god has commanded now, that doesn't mean that we are saved by what we do because we are saved by what Jesus has done for us. But it does mean that we live in obedience and love to him, that obedience and love are always linked together. Now that we are saved, we're to live the saved life. That is by loving God and loving others in the way that the Bible teaches us to love. But as we live a life of love, we need to be careful of those who seek to deceive believers. That we need to focus on abiding in Jesus, and that way we will be able to spot deceivers. Have a look at verse 7 with me. It says this, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. 
See, if we understand and know the truth about Jesus, if we know his word in the Bible, if we're walking in truth and love, we'll be able to follow Jesus and not be so easily drawn away by deceivers. That quite often people will take anything that is said from up front in a church at face value. That quite often people will accept anything that is said from a church stage right across the world. That quite often you can walk into a Christian bookstore and buy a book by someone who the Bible would probably define as a deceiver. And being loving doesn't mean that you let just anyone teach you about God. That as, for example, I know I was part of a church where the youth were invited to a youth camp. And the leader on this youth camp was a guy who, well, he he was a deceiver. He's uh, said many things that aren't true in the Bible, but also he was a guy who faked cancer, took donations, and then professed to be miraculously healed. The kind of deceiver you don't want teaching your youth. So we simply said no to that camp. Simple as that. And that was the most loving thing that we could actually do for our youth at that time. Even though they claimed Christianity, it was quite clear that that teacher was a deceiver. Let's keep looking. Have a look at verse 10. It tells us this. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. But the elder's writing to this woman, he's writing to this church that she's she's a part of, to abide in Jesus, not deceivers. And he is warning that those deceivers, they are out there. And there are many deceivers out there and they still exist today across all different sorts of Christian denominations, including those who call themselves Presbyterian. So rather than perhaps poke fun at another denomination, I think it's better to reflect on something closer to home, a little bit more closer to home, that deceivers are out there. Now, on your screens, you'll see this article, and you probably can Google it later and look it up, that this is an article about a Presbyterian church who has deceivers. It says in the article that the majority of PCUSA pastors and members, according to their denomination's own data, completely deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. They completely reject the teachings of the Bible. But if we like that elect lady, like the the elder writes to, are walking in truth and love, then we'll be able to focus on abiding in Jesus, not deceivers, and we'll be able to spot deceivers like this if we are walking in truth and love. So this morning, as we reflect on this little letter that's tucked in the back of the New Testament, how are you walking in truth and love? How could you be walking in truth and love? Are you someone who's perhaps scared of revealing the truth? Are you someone who perhaps hides the truth? Or are you someone who wants to know and share the truth about Jesus? Are you someone who wants to abide in the truth of Jesus? See, this morning, 2 John reminds us that as we walk in truth and love, we know that it is linked to obedience in God's word. And if we are walking in truth and love, we'll be able to spot those deceivers. So for us this morning, let's abide in Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask that you would help us to walk in truth and in love because we know that we're not very good at it, that we know that we fall short of your glory. Lord, we pray that you would encourage us this week by the power of your Holy Spirit to help us be obedient to your word as we seek to love you and love others, as we seek to share the love of Jesus, the love you showed us in him when he died on the cross. Help us to share that message with the rest of the world. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.